Buju Nindinaway Maganiduk, JP Renquist and Dijanakaz Jaganashimang, Kibizindanawa Dibiki Gizus. You're listening to The Moon. My name is JP Renquist. We have special coverage now of the passing of former Fond du Lac Band chairman Bill Hool. According to an official release from Fond du Lac Band, Mr. Hool was chairman of the RBC from 1974 to 1988. During his tenure as chairman, Mr. Hool's vision was to help alleviate poverty on Fond du Lac Reservation. He aggressively sought to bring gaming to Fond du Lac. He was a prominent figure in initiating the Fond du Luth Casino. He was founder in development of and served as chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission. Mr. Hool also served as the Brookston District Representative from 1968 to 1974 and was a driving force in the education process on Fond du Lac with his involvement with the Johnson O'Malley Committee. Mr. Hool was a veteran, having proudly served in the U.S. Navy. Visitation for former Chairman Hool is on Friday, July 5th from 4 to 7 p.m. in the Hanfit Funeral Home on Washington Avenue in Cloquet, Visitation continues on Saturday, July 6th from 10 a.m. until 11 a.m. when there is a funeral service, which is also in the Hanvit Funeral Home. Following uh, the uh, funeral service, there will be a burial with full military honors by the um, Cloquet Combined Honor Guard and the Fond du Lac Honor Guard. We have special coverage on WGZS of this, uh, including conversations with people who knew and worked with former Chairman Hool. We'll start with Fond du Lac's current tribal chairwoman, Karen Diver. Chairman Bill Houle really exhibited true entrepreneurship when the notion of Indian gaming first kind of rose in Indian country. It was out of a small tribe in California who Um, basically asserted the right to regulate gaming because it was civil regulatory, meaning that the ban still had jurisdiction or the tribe um, to make those kinds of laws for themselves under self-governance. And it was being litigated um, and found that, yes, tribes did retain jurisdiction to um, exert control of a civil regulatory nature. And at that time, with Bill's leadership, Chairman Hull's leadership, the Fond du Lac Band was one of the very early tribes into gaming and started with Big Bucks Bingo um, over where the Head Start is. Um, and, you know, shortly thereafter, started getting into gaming machines. Um, kind of concurrent with Big Bucks Bingo, they had some discussions with the city of Duluth about doing it in Duluth, possibly an off-reservation location. Um, His legacy is really that he saw a need in this community um, to develop our own source of revenue, develop a surrogate tax base, and have a way to pay for those things that the federal government has never been adequately funding all along, as is required under the trust responsibility, um, whether it be education or health and human services, um, building more houses, acquiring our land back, building infrastructure. Um, Gaming has really been what has allowed the Fond du Lac Band to truly be economically self-determined and have the resources to build the stability to do service delivery that serves band members, to provide employment, um, to fill gaps in funding. And I think when we look around now, and for those of our tribal members who grew up here and are now elders, um, there wasn't enough of anything. There was no job opportunities. Uh, Very few employers off reservation um, made regular employment available to tribal members. That's why so many left. Um, Most of the houses still had um, outhouses. Um, They were inadequate. They were overcrowded. Um, You know, so to be able to have a way to supplement what we had coming in from the feds and state sources, um, provide those job opportunities, invest in our people through scholarship programs, etc., that legacy is not only what we see now, it is what we will see for generations because those impacts have made the difference in people's lives. And when you can change the opportunities for people, you change families and you change generations. And with Bill's passing, 
Um, we lost a visionary who saw something that was the beginning of our own um, economic destiny. Um, did it fill all needs? Certainly not. Um, but we are certainly by far um, light years away where, from where we would have been it, if we did not have gaming as an economic engine in our community. You're listening to The Moon. My name is J.P. Rehnquist. We have special coverage now of the passing of former Fond du Lac Band chairman Bill Houle. Michelle Lee is a longtime newswoman who has worked for a generation in newsrooms across the North Country area, and she received much of her introduction, she says, to uh, Native American culture and to treaty law and, and much more, working on stories that involve Mr. Houle. She joined us to share some detailed news analysis and also to share some of her personal experiences working with the chairman. Well, I did come to Duluth as a kind of a cub reporter to Channel 3 back in 1983, and that was kind of midway into um, Bill's term as chair uh, on the res. And uh, he was pretty much my introduction to Native Americans between he and Jim Northrup. They were my introduction. I, I was very... Um, uh, may I say, ignorant to life on the reservation and uh, the goals for self-determination. I mean, it's something I should have learned a lot of in school, but unfortunately when I went to school, didn't do a lot of talking about that. So I guess I had some practical experience and, and I learned on the job. One of the things that uh, is being remembered by many people is his role as a mentor. He was very patient. <laughs> um, and with him, it didn't seem like there was no there was no ignorant questions. Um, he was very forthcoming, and uh, I was talking about him with someone uh, yesterday, and they described him as practical and brave. And I thought, boy, that really nailed it. Um, Bill Hull was very practical, yet he was brave to do what he set out to do, and 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 what his um, reservation business committee did. Um, you, you may not be old enough to remember, but in the early 1980s, the local economy had gone into the tank. People were li leaving the mines. Uh, you know, it was like whoever leaves Duluth the last, please shut off the lights. It, mm -hmm. The economy was really terrible. And I would imagine that that was tenfold on the reservation. And he really cared about his people and, and how to save his people and how to improve them and move them forward into the future. And that group of people decided that gaming was going to be it. And there was a lot of education steps that he and his other leaders there had to educate the greater community about the history of gaming with the Native Americans. And of course, then the treaties, which a lot of us never did really learn in school. Um, so it was a real learning process for all of us. And it was sometimes a difficult lesson, but something that we all ended up learning. And hopefully everybody benefited from that. You did see coming here a place that looks very different than if you were to come oh. to our, our reservation today. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. Um, I, know, I know that uh, Jim Northrup used to talk about the commodity cans and, and the cars piling up in people's yards. You know, whoever had the most junk cars had the most ponies and it was just kind of a tradition back in those days and mm -hmm. I never really saw it that bad but I did see the abject poverty I did see the high un unemployment and there was really no job opportunities for native people it, it was very difficult um, a lot of people were still living subsistence living um, living off the land um, you know um, basically harvesting their rice they still do a lot of these traditional things today but it was a necessity for survival, still back in the early 1980s. Um, and I, I, listening to how they, th there were some failed attempts at job creation down there in the beginning. Everything, when you start something new, you're going to have failures or you're going to learn lessons. And I think that's what the RBC did. They learned a lot of valuable lessons as they, you know, inched their way into the economic environment that was required of them to bring their people along and to create jobs. Uh, I, I remember them talking about the bingo hall and the gymnasium, and that was, that was the big exciting thing. And that was my really first introduction to Native gaming, and uh, it was fairly simple. And I also remember the RBC in the double-wide trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe yeah. a lot of people 
um, that are living on the res today don't remember that, but things were pretty simple back in those days, and, and it was a struggle to get the attention of any um, other government outside their own, you know, their own RBC, their own committee. But uh, eventually they did. They did catch, capture the, the attention of the Northland and uh, the nation. Can you talk about Mayor John Fido and just give a thumbnail sketch of, of him and his style and then the, tile, the style of these two um, intense, I don't even know what the word is, <laughs> remarkable leaders of different they, backgrounds and races um, and what happened? I'll tell you what, you would never put the two of those guys together, um, although they both cared deeply about the people that they were representing. And, and I guess that was the tie that bound those two. John Fito, the youngest mayor to ever be elected in Duluth, he had big dreams for his community. Bill Houle, he had big dreams for his reservation. And I don't know how the two of them came together as far as creating the uh, Fond du Luth Casino, but a lot of people said, you know, this can't be done. This is impossible. You're never going to be able to build a casino inside of a city. You know, that, that's, you know, it, it's impossible. But the two of them, they stuck to it, and they fought for it. They appealed the federal government, and it got done. And it was like everybody was going, oh, my God. And at that point, the Sears, the old Sears building was just kind of a, you know, dilapidated building that was closed down. The Sears had left downtown for the uh, the Miller Hill Mall, and uh, so it was like it was kismet that it all came together. And I, I remember the grand opening; it was just so fantastic, and and people were celebrating in the streets that this wonderful thing had been born in Duluth. We're talking with Michelle Lee. You probably knew that because people have, for a generation, have heard her on uh, TV, um, sharing the news as an anchor and as a reporter. Um, talk about what it was like to have Vegas lights and gambling in <laughs> old downtown Duluth in the mid-1980s. My, one of my former co-anchors, uh, Duke Scorch, and, and I went down there and actually played the slot machines, and it was like, this is just so weird. I mean, this is in Duluth, Minnesota. We're playing slots, and it was just a real exciting, um, very dramatic uh, happenstance that this happened in Duluth, Minnesota, and it was a real thriving enterprise from day one. Um, Chairwoman Anderson um, from Mille Lacs Band, who passed away on Saturday, and uh, and Chairman Houle, again, are very well known as people who asserted a government-to-government relationship with the United States. It, and it, again, that was a real learning curve for all of us to understand that 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 natives are sovereign, na- you know, parts of sovereign nations, and that was really nothing in our vocabulary at that time in the early 1980s. And they had to educate us once again and to lead us through that whole process. That you no, know, this is a full standing government, and we all had to go back and read the treaties to understand it. And people like Marge and Bill were very. They were our teachers. They taught us exactly what the laws were and and how you you have to be, we're all on equal footing, but yet we're separate. Does that make sense? It does. I know that health is an important issue for you, and I'm wondering, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, and we are live, if you could talk a little bit about um, the developments in uh, health care, and of course there's still some disparities as well. Well, I'll tell you what, I've had a chance to go down to the, um, the clinic down there, and most recently I had a chance to interview Dr. Arnie Vinio, and I am so impressed with the services that are offered to not only the elders down there, but the whole population from the reservation, and they are a leader in diabetic care um, and, and heart health and what they're doing, and people don't realize it. it was, it's like the best-kept secret. There's some quality medical attention being given down there and I'm, I'm so impressed and the health care and the dental and it it just blows me away when I walk through there but yet um, what I, I, I still enjoy seeing is that it's still very culturally embedded yeah, that the culture is still important in the in the in the world of science mm-hmm, yeah. um, 
But I also want to touch on, on sure, a little absolutely. bit on, on, on the importance of education and Bill Hool. Mm-hmm. Um, when I look back and, you know, most of the kids at that time, there, were, there wasn't much schooling. Um, and I see what's happening on the reservation with your beautiful schools and the college and also with the um, partnership with St. Scholastica. And so many young natives have gone through this process now. And I remember Bill saying that that's what we have to do. We have to educate our kids so that they not only get a good education, a solid education, but they come back and they work on the reservation, Mm -hmm. that they help drive the future of the reservation. And I see that today, and it's so exciting. I mean, who would have thought of it, you know, 20, 30 years ago that that would happen? But Bill had that dream, and the people he worked with had that dream, and now it's coming to reality, and it's so exciting. Other memorable stories in your um, many years, um, decades, covering Fond du Lac Reservation and your experiences with Chairman Hool? Well, I remember that the RBC was kind of, I, I thought it was like almost like the Masons, a very secret society. So I went to a couple of the meetings, and it was kind of scary when, as a young reporter. But I remember I couldn't get daycare, and I just had my son, and he was probably not more than four or five weeks old. And I had to go down there or go to the reservation to cover a story. And I couldn't get daycare, so I brought my baby with me to the RBC meeting. And everybody was so kind to me and so understanding. And I thought, oh, you know, there's nothing to be scared of. These people are just trying to do a job, and I'm trying to do a job. And, and that was kind of set the stage. And, and I have so many fond memories of those early days, you know, with, with Chairman Hool and, and the rest. For me, I, I, my, my career, I've, I've been, have, have had a really rich experience living here in the Northland. Um, a lot of people tend to move away after a couple of years, but um, my heart was taken here in the Northland, and I have, will stay here forever. <laughs> but it's, it's been fun to be an observer to this history, and I hope I have a few more years to observe. <laughs> I, you, uh, I, we hope so, too. Uh, Michelle Lee, uh, news anchor for the Northlands News Center and um, a a longtime uh, news professional. I want to thank you for taking time today to help us remember and provide some of your perspective analysis on the loss of uh, our Chairman Houle. And I have to say again, as someone said yesterday, he was a practical man and he was a brave man. And that pretty much sums it up. You are listening to WGZS, Tabika Gizis, radio service from Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. This is special coverage of the passing of former Fond du Lac Band tribal chairman Bill Houle, who passed away on June 30th. Visitation for Mr. Houle will be Friday, July 5th from 4 to 7 p.m. in the Hanfit Funeral Home on Washington Avenue in Cloquet. Visitation continues uh, Saturday, July 6th from 10 a.m. until the 11 a.m. funeral service which is also in the funeral home, full military honors by the Cloquet Combined Honor Guard and the Fond du Lac Honor Guard will be a part of the ceremony. My name is Phil Norgard. I'm the Director of Human Services for the Fond du Lac Band Lake Spirit Chippewa. What was your experience working with uh, Chairman Hool who passed away? Well, I got to know Bill in uh, 1979 when I first uh, came to Fond du Lac. It was uh, back in the bad old days when uh, there weren't a lot of resources available to the community and uh, tribal government was a pretty small time affair. There were fewer than uh, 45 employees uh, for the whole band and I actually started as a volunteer. Uh, Bill was the chairman then and uh, everybody knew it and uh, he had been a chair for a couple years and had been on council before that and had worked JOM before that and uh, had been an active member in the community before that when he came back from the service, uh, United States Navy. So he was uh, pretty well known, well respected, and the guy had uh, just a tremendous gift of gab and uh, knew how to tell a joke, uh, was a good listener, uh, was familiar with a lot of the uh, uh, ways in which you could get things done politically. And so uh, he was a great. Uh, uh, mentor for me. He, uh, he taught me an awful lot about what will work and what won't work uh, in the Indian community. And uh, I just have an enormous amount of respect for him and lots of good memories. Bill was a great fisherman. And uh, he internalized, uh, I think, uh, fishing as, as a way of doing business, of, of, 
of sort of like winning people, of catching supporters, uh, knowing how to bait and switch, uh, knowing how to get the job done, knowing how to fill the creel, fill the stringer. Uh, he was he was a guy who was on the on the move all the time, and sort of like always thinking about how to capture something or get something done. He was a, a results oriented person, and uh, you know, although fishing was never far from his heart. Uh, the way in which a person pursued fishing was something that was just part of his composition, part of his intellectual makeup. And when he saw opportunities, uh, or when there maybe when other people didn't see opportunities or didn't see a way to catch the fish, Bill would figure out how to catch the fish. And uh, when we were looking for uh, congressional approval to build a new clinic, we were actually looking for a congressional uh, allocation, and there weren't any at that time. There weren't uh, any clinics? There weren't any congressional allocations for new clinics. They didn't want to build new clinics because there was enough square footage. And uh, we went out to Washington and visited uh, Dr. Everett Rhodes, who was the director of the Indian Health Service at that time. And, uh, you know, Bill had paved the way to uh, getting our clinic condemned and, you know, doing some other work uh, for facilities. We could justify it, we just didn't have any money. And uh, I remember him sitting in the director's office saying, you say you can't give us an allocation. We don't want all the money at once. Rent this to us for 10 years, and we'll borrow the money. And Everett Rhodes couldn't say no, because it, it was just too reasonable. It, it, you know, in other words, it was, lease the space from us. We'll borrow the money, build the clinic. You just promised to lease the space from us. And uh, so he said, OK. He got approval from a guy in uh, his boss, which was the secretary or undersecretary of human service at that time. And I can't remember what the annual allocation was, but it was like one tenth of the total cost of the addition for uh, the new building for Minoyawa and Human Services Center. And, you know, Bill just didn't take no for an answer. I mean, the, the secret was, is if, if the guy's telling you no, or if the fish is refusing a certain bait, you throw something else at him. And he just never lost his, his joy in doing that. I mean, at the, I think the guy had just enjoyment out of finding out what was going to work in whatever situation he happened to be uh, uh, operating in. So that was an example of how the Minoya and Human Services Center actually got started. And uh, it was with uh, a couple of visits to Washington, D.C. with a very persuasive tribal leader who really wouldn't take no for an answer. And uh, it was fun. I mean, I learned a lot just by watching the guy operate because he he was just always thinking of another way to bring something at you if you said no to the way he described it the first time. Just sitting around the table, visiting with him, and then listening to how he analyzed the discussion on the way home in the car to me was a, just a priceless opportunity to pick up on cultural cues and ways of interaction that I just wouldn't have seen as a non-Indian person. Just wouldn't have seen him, wouldn't have understood him. And so he wanted me to be effective and I think helped me a lot just because he saw me as a person who was going to stick around for a while and, uh, and try and do something for the community, which is, you know, basically what he was trying to do. So we spent a lot of windshield time together and uh, I, I heard several of his stories more than once. And uh, luckily, most of them were very amusing. He was, he was a very good conversationalist. People liked to see him come in the room because he, he made you feel comfortable, unless he was mad at you, and then you knew that right away, and you didn't want to be in the same room with him then. Uh, but if, if, if things were going well, and, uh, and you were doing your job and getting your work done, he made you feel very welcome, uh, very comfortable, and uh, he was also willing to praise people who did a good job. He, he recognized it. One of his favorite sayings when uh, there was a naysayer somewhere, uh, you know, um, bringing up some negative comment about something, he, he would often say, don't argue with success. You know, this is a successful thing. Don't kill it. You know, let's try and make it better. But don't feel like you've got to kill it. And it really uh, gave a lot of us who felt like we always wanted to do more, bring more to the community, uh, have more the, uh, for the community to enjoy, uh, a chance to s sort of like realize that it wasn't going to come all at once. You, you know, you, you don't always fill the stringer every time you go fishing. You, 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 get, you get small resorts, uh, results sometimes and then larger results at others. But overall, your skill keeps improving and improving and improving. And uh, he, was a, 
he was a hell of a fisherman. It, he was just, it was, it was, it was just something to just to to, to watch him fish uh, up the Brule River, for example. And I've seen other people do it. A lot of other people do it, and nobody fished the way Bill did. He was just, he was a master. What is it that community members, in in your view? can do to carry forward his legacy or to honor, you know, the things that you say he did for the community? I think uh, that he would want everyone to respect themselves as an Indian person and to be unapologetic for that and to always remember that they have a place uh, on this earth that the Creator gave them. Uh, they had a culture that the Creator provided for them and the closer they maintain that, and the dearer that is to their heart, the happier they'll be. Miigwech. Thank you, Phil. Miigwech. Another person who worked very closely with tribal chairman Houle during his many years of service to Fond du Lac Band was Chuck Smith, who now works as the veteran service coordinator and is one of the organizers of the upcoming Fond du Lac Veterans Powwow. I served with Billy. I was the secretary treasurer from 82 to 86. Okay. And so I served with Bill as secretary treasurer that year, or those years, and uh, he, uh, it, it is a great loss for all of us here on Fond du Lac. Um, Bill was a committee member here on a veterans committee, and uh, uh, Bill was a phenomenal man. Uh, he was as sharp as a tack uh, back then and uh, all the way to the end. I mean, he had a remarkable memory. And when you talk about the various things that, uh, that happened during his uh, tenure as, uh, as chairman, um, we used to sit and talk. He was a security guard here. And uh, when he would come on at uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock, I'd go over and have a cup of coffee with him. And uh, I'm going to miss my friend. He, um, we, we used to talk about a variety of things. Uh, sometimes talk politics, talk old time politics, uh, some of the things that uh, that uh, me and him did as uh, tribal council uh, members. Um, he uh, was instrumental in uh, forming NIGA, National Indian Gaming Association. We took those uh, set of those first meetings uh, down in uh, uh, with the Seminoles, Chairman Billy, um, and worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Next thing you know, we've got uh, National Indian Gaming Association of all the gaming tribes. It uh, it was something that we needed to do uh, as tribes, gaming tribes, and. Uh, to uh, ensure that uh, we protected that right to do gaming. Um, I think at that time there was, uh, we, uh, me and Bill used to talk about Senate File 555, and uh, that's uh, the Senate created uh, a three member commission at that time. I think Tony Hope was, I, I just remember him uh, being on that uh, commission. But uh, yeah, it uh, was a significant achievement in any country. Talk yeah. about that time and the growth that happened here, I mean, right here, right where we're sitting in. Well, we had, uh, um, at that time, we had a bingo. And we had, uh, we're selling uh, pull tabs at our bingo. And uh, we had a feeling that it would progress to casinos. And, uh, and so right around, uh, oh, it was probably 84, we started talking about um, expanding. The bingo started out right up here, where uh, the top of the hill up here, there used to be... Uh, uh, school. We had the bingo in uh, the um, right at the school there, right in the uh, I think the cafeteria. Um, 
and then it went from there to over here at the uh, gymnasium and we started talking about uh, an expansion down in Duluth so we went down looking for property and uh, we started talking with the uh, mayor at that time I believe it was John Fiedel talking with the city council uh, matter of fact Julia Marshall at that time uh, she uh, was uh, uh, she had opposed any gaming and she's a like a philanthropist yeah they she, might call her. yeah I, she was a philanthropist she had uh, she had uh, uh, the Marshalls I believe were into uh, uh, mining way back when and uh, she was one of the heirs and uh, she had uh, a few bucks in her pocket she had come up one day to a tribal council meeting and she uh, brought her checkbook and she says uh, I I will write you a check right now to Fond du Lac uh, I believe it was for three million dollars if we did not go down to Duluth and uh, and start uh, a casino down there and uh, yeah, we uh, we told Julia we appreciated her uh, point of view but uh, thanks but no thanks and uh, one thing led to another down in Duluth. We uh, were looking at the old Sears building down there, and uh, that's where, all right, now Fond du the sitting, is in the old Sears building. We bought the building, and uh, and lo and behold, we started uh, uh, bingo down there, and I expanded. We knew it was going to expand into uh, casinos, and that's where uh, one of our casinos we have are down in Duluth. Talk about Chairman Hool and his uh, role in this unique first ever, and I think it may still be only ever, depending on who you ask, uh, relationship of its kind between the city of Duluth and Fond du Lac. Well, there was uh, what, what we were looking at is uh, Chairman Billy down in Florida. And what he had done is he had... He, he had uh, bought a piece of property down there, um, the Seminole tribe, and uh, and they ended up putting a, a bingo hall on it. Well, we thought we could do the same thing. And to make a long story short there, what uh, uh, Chairman Hull, uh, we started meetings with uh, Washington, D.C., and... Uh, what had happened is the senior George Bush, who was uh, the vice president to Ronald Reagan, is the one that gave the go-ahead for the Fond du Lac project down in, in Duluth. And that was after uh, meeting with the, uh, the city uh, officials down there, and uh, they uh, gave the okay to put that piece of property into uh, reservation, uh, or get to give it reservation status. Uh, which was probably the most unique agreement. I don't believe there's another one uh, around. I remember the Sears building when I was a kid back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s down there. I was in that building and uh, I don't remember it closing, but uh, uh, after in the 60s we went on relocation to uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And come back after uh, a little stint in the Marines back in 73. But uh, yeah, that uh, that was kind of a, a unique building in there. When you looked on the inside, that building was totally bare. And I remember, again, being in there when I was a kid. Uh, it had really nice, I think, maple wooden floors. And what had happened in the in the winter of uh, of eighty five eighty six, a pipe burst down in the basement, and when he looked, when we went into the building to inspect that after that, uh, all of the tribal council went down there and took a look. Uh, the entire basement was full of water. You looked downstairs, looked down the stairs, it was right to the ceiling, and what had happened is all of that uh, water. Uh, in that that building, and uh, with the it buckled the floors, every single floor there 
first floor, second floor was, uh, geez, it was, I remember one spot on that thing, it, it had to be probably uh, uh, 10 feet high, you know, it was just buckled. Uh, and that's what we would have had, we would have had that wooden floor in there. But after that, we had to tear it up. But, uh, but it's a symbolic of my memory of that time in Duluth, which is, it was just like the whole town was shutting down. It was like everyone, the the jobs were leaving, and uh, I remember a lot. Everyone was talking about buy local, and there were issues with unions, and there was uh, foreign cars with foreign steel coming in, and uh, and uh, it was like the town was collapsing, and then this huge development. Well, I think that was one of the selling points too to the. Uh uh, city council and to the mayor down there and uh, I believe that uh, uh, their system of government I believe is strong mayor we council I believe um, and one of the selling points was exactly that is that uh, stores were closing down downtown was uh, was getting to be kind of bare down there a lot of stores that I remembered on there Snyder's drugstore you remember Snyder's that was gone uh, the last block was gone. Uh, walls. Remember walls. Walls was gone. Yep. Uh, and you look down there, and there was just. Uh, you took a drive downtown, and uh, all those stores were empty. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is perhaps uh, uh, revitalize the downtown area, and uh, we presented the uh, the council and the mayor with uh, uh, an opportunity. Uh, to put a casino down there in the middle of uh, of Duluth, and after uh, we got the go ahead from uh, uh, George uh, Bush, the vice president, George Bush, and um, uh, I believe we got a call from Washington, and uh, Henry Buffalo and myself uh, flew down to uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and. Uh, we went, uh, and we had to go out to the Whipple building, federal building, uh, to the solicitor, and uh, they, we had to tweak that uh, that agreement to put that into uh, into uh, reservation status. There's a difference between reservation status and trust. When you put it in a trust, it takes the the uh, um, Congress an act of Congress to put it in trust, and that, that came later. But, uh, uh, and then we went back to the uh, um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and there's a document down there that uh, I signed, and that uh, Earl Barlow, the area director, had signed, and uh, that was it. Uh, it was, uh, now we're ready to uh, let the games begin. That's when it uh, really started to uh, uh, to blossom. The uh, we were just cleaning up the inside of uh, the building at that time, and uh, all of a sudden we knew that uh, we were going to start uh, a bingo inside that that building, and then progress from there into a gaming casino. And lo and behold, uh, matter of fact, uh, it was uh, George Mangle. I think we hired as uh, our first casino manager down there, and uh, he presented uh, some names as to what to name it. And I thought that uh, Fondleuth was a pretty good play on Fond du Lac and Duluth, and so we, as a council, selected Fondleuth. Pretty cool. No. The casino has brought in far more than the than the three million dollars that uh, Julia Marshall, you say, offered. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's brought in uh, exponentially more than that. One of the things that in the official release from Fond du Lac Band that we got um, talks about is um, Chairman Hull's uh, efforts to alleviate poverty. There was a truly a lack of housing. Um, uh, people, uh, we, we had, uh, I think, uh, uh, food commodity programs, not here on the reservation, but in the area. And uh, 
we had to rely on uh, uh, our parents' ricing in the uh, fall of the year in order to get us uh, school clothes. Uh, I remember always eating game all the time. I think Bill, the same way, talked about eating deer meat and uh, snaring rabbits and fishing, and uh, that's how we lived. Uh, in terms of employment, uh, I think our employment was well above, uh, you know, forty percent, fifty percent. Wasn't any work. Uh, so, you know, Chairman Hull took a look at that. Like I said, he had. Uh, he had looked at that uh, for a far greater time than I, and uh, during his uh, tenure as uh, uh, Brookston representative and uh, tribal chairman, uh, looked for ways to alleviate that. And uh, gaming was probably one of the, uh, the best ways. We ended up, uh, look where we're at today. I mean, uh, we got housing, we got employment. I think uh, anybody that really wants a job can have a job. Um, it's uh, it has progressed uh, so far from where it used to be um, without uh, uh, people like uh, Chairman Hull uh, with the insight uh, with the empathy of going through those times he knows what it's like to be hungry back then and uh, he wanted to do something about it. And uh, the, we have a school that he helped bring here. We've got a clinic that he helped bring here. We've got, uh, uh, you look at all the, the HUD housing that we have. I mean, he, uh, he was quite the gentleman, quite the, uh, the tribal chair. You talked before about your relationship with him. I mean, you're, it sounds like there was some fr there was a friendship there, or maybe even some mentoring there that went on. You know, I you know Bill. I watched Bill when uh, I was a young tribal council member. I was uh, like 26 years old when uh, I was uh, on a tribal council, and uh, uh, I watched. Um, I watched him talk I, uh, in front of uh, groups of people, and, and and I asked him one time. I said, "Bill, I said, how do you come up with the words?" And I was had a hand in his pocket, and he showed me these Magisa shells that he used to have, and he says, "Right here." And he says, "This is what I Magisa's. rely on." Yeah, they're uh, little small shells, and yeah, which he had in his pocket. They're uh, important. They were important to him. They're uh, uh, spiritual, and so and that's what he told me that he held on to when he talked. It, it helped him, and uh, to listen to uh, Bill talk, I I, I watched uh, uh, Chairman uh, Jordan from uh, Roger Jordan from uh, Red, Red, Lake, Red Lake, and uh, God. He, you listen to some of those uh, elder statesmen of ours that we've had, and, and uh, listen to them talk from the stage, and uh, it's a marvel. I mean, uh, way back when, uh, uh, when I was on the council, I I just couldn't see myself jumping in front of uh, you know 500 people, 300 people, 1,000 people the way that they did, and. Uh, uh, he helped me uh, greatly as uh, as a young tribal council member, as a friend. Uh, I am going to miss my friend. I used to uh, I used to hunt for Bill. I, I brought him uh, at least a couple of deer every year. My uh, me and uh, my two boys we hunted for him. William. He liked the uh, little small deer, he, he sure liked the ribs on the deer, so we always made sure that uh, we didn't shoot the ribs up. And uh, I, I remember at, at one, uh, the most deer I ever shot in my life one year, you know, hunting for the elders, I think it was 29. I had, I had that many tags from elders to bring them deer. 
and uh, we always had Bill's tag and uh, it's going to be sad not to be able to hunt for him uh, it's going to be it, it's, when, when I heard that he had passed away I had walked in the, the door on Monday and I looked over at the security office there and I always used to remember what he would say he would say what's happening man and uh, I would uh, walk in there and I'd, uh, I always used to tell him was, you don't have any mucky wop which is coffee and he goes yeah he said I just made some so I'd go in there and have a, uh, a cup of coffee with him and we'd sit there and shoot the bull about uh, anything fishing could be uh, old politics uh, some of the people that uh, we used to know some people that aren't here anymore Uh, it's going to be different without him. Uh, we're all going to miss him. He is uh, quite the gentleman. And let me tell you, Bill was as sharp yesterday as he was 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago. He was sharp. He, uh, he just had a, had a way with uh, keeping abreast of uh, what was going on uh, in Indian country. And uh, he'd sit there and listen to him. His, uh, he had a, a, a unique understanding of just the way things worked. Could you talk a little bit about the experience of, of letting go and of the, of the transition? Um, that happens in Anishinaabe ways. And if you can't share about it, I know some things are not for radio. Well, uh, sometimes that's a private thing. We we talked about uh, uh, this morning uh, with one of the uh, uh, committee members uh, on the powwow mm -hmm. about closure uh, with Bill and. Uh, um, we are going to uh, do something for him at the Palo. He was uh, a veteran. He was our, our chairman. Uh, he was our friend. You know, he certainly was a father and an uncle uh, and a brother. Uh, we will do something for him our way uh, for closure on Bill. You know, no one will ever forget about him. Uh, he's an unforgettable man. Uh, I said, I, I, I am going to miss my friend. So whatever we come up with out there, that will be our way. He uh, talked to you a lot about how he was still seeing things. Um, how did he see things? You know, How did he see his legacy or, or, or maybe if he didn't frame it that way, how did he see the the results of that of that time in the seventies and eighties and the fruits of that? Well, Bill could look right out the window, uh, and uh, he could see some of the projects that uh, you know he worked on uh, as a chairman, as as a tribal council member at that time, and uh, you know he was proud of the things that uh, that was accomplished on his watch and he could drive around the reservation and see the houses that were brought in here, the, the clinic down down the road, uh, the uh, elderly housing, uh, all of that. He, uh, he was proud and uh, he He looked at it as, uh, as, as, as a privilege to serve uh, the band. It was a privilege for him. It was an honor for him to do what he did. And uh, that's the way he's seen it. It doesn't sound like you're painting the portrait of a man that was like desperate or wanted to hold on to power he wanted it was more a man that wanted to serve and give yes that that was bill that was bill
He uh, is a very humble man. Very humble. He um, he he had his uh, his time on the council and. Uh, um, What he did after that is uh, he didn't involve himself in, in, or let's say impose on that tribal council over there, over the years. Since he, I think Bill's been, uh, I think his last year was in 88. So for the most part, he's, he stayed out of the way. Did he ever talk about fishing with you? Oh, God. I, let's see. He, uh... He taught me how to steal that fish, and uh, I'll tell you that's one of the greatest things that uh, I have ever learned. And uh, I, I truly appreciate him taking the time with me uh, way back when. I think I started fishing back in the uh, in the uh, middle '80s, I believe, and. Uh, a steelhead rod and uh, start talking to him about you know how to fish you tell me how to hold on to the line what to feel you know how to hold the rod uh, how to land a fish and uh, uh, we always uh, practice catch and release uh, we rarely kill the fish we just uh, we fish for the pleasure of just catching a fish and then releasing it. And boy, I tell you, I, I watched that man do some phenomenal things with a, with a rod. I, I, <laughs> I don't know who else could do that other than Bill. Uh, I seen him one time, he, uh, he said there was a fish on the other side of that rock there and that tail off and he started peeling line out and he so he could see through the water? No. Well, we all had uh, Polaroid glasses on, but he t he knew there was a fish out there. And he flipped that, uh, that line, and it ran on the other side of the rock, and all of a sudden that line straightened out, and he set the hook, and that rod, that fish took off downstream, and it started peeling line out of his reel. And it peeled line, and Bill, he stuck that rod down into the water, and I remember me and Bob Martin were watching him. I said, what is he doing? He goes, I don't know. He said, I have to ask him that. So all of a sudden, uh, uh, we watched the lion, and he had turned upstream. I said, where'd that fish come from? I said, is that the same fish that uh, he first... Uh, Set the hook on, and he goes, I think it is. And all of a sudden, he pulls this fish in. It's about maybe, oh, I don't know, probably about a six pound, uh, seven pound steelhead. He pulls it in, he looks at it, pulls uh, out his, uh, his uh, needle nose pliers, and pulls that hook out of him, and let him go. And he started looking at his, uh, his hook and his, his, we used yarn. He looked at his yarn, he walked out of the water. And uh, me and Bob asked him, he said, how do you do that? And he said that one of the things that you always must remember, you have to remember that a fish has a desire to go upstream. He says, if you take the pressure off him, he'll turn around and go back. And that's exactly what that fish did. And I says, by putting that low into the water like that, we did that with your, your reel because he had uh, his reel all the way in the water he was just holding on and he says I took the pressure off him and he said when he didn't feel that pressure anymore he said he started doing what he naturally would do was to go upstream and he says then I fought him again and he said I pulled him in I started thinking about that too about uh, and he says just the the pleasure of catching a fish and uh, that's one of the things he taught me I I catch and release too. Uh, I, I was uh, taught by the master. Bill was the, the master steelhead fisherman. Yeah. It seems to me like some of these other, you know, political accomplishments. You know, having George Bush 
<laughs> you know, sign the or you know, make the the final uh, green light for for Fond du Luth to go ahead and. Uh, I mean, just other things that, that I've been learning about him through what people are sharing with me more than in news reports or anything else. But um, he really does just seem like a remarkable man. Yeah, he, um, I think there was a balance with him. Is that, uh, uh, you know, you look at the, the weight of being a politician that's on your shoulders. And uh, one of the things that he'd done to uh, probably relieve that pressure uh, was to go have some fun and, uh, and, and go fishing. He loved steelhead fishing, that guy. He was a steelhead fisherman to the end. He liked going cat fishing too. He liked going uh, fishing for pumpkin seeds out on Lost Lake. He liked walleye fishing, but uh, uh, that man was a steelhead fisherman. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, he done to relieve any of the uh, pressures of life and uh, politics. Yeah. And he was a good friend, too. He was a good friend. Yeah. He truly was. You've been listening to special coverage of the passing of former Fond du Lac Band Chairman Bill Houle. Chairman Houle passed away on June 30th. He was surrounded by his family and... He was born August 22nd, 1931, and moved on from this world June 30th, 2013. Services and visitation are as follows. Visitation Friday, July 5th from 4 to 7 p.m. in the Hanfit Funeral Home in Cloquet, continuing on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. with an 11 a.m. funeral service. Full military honors will be provided by the Cloquet Combined Honor Guard and the Fond du Lac Honor Guard. This is WGZS Cloquet.